Namaste, namaskaram, vanakam, namo, namaha. Jai Ganesha. Reading from The American Dream, Waking Up. This is a book I wrote in 1993. Chapter 1. The American Dream. We are all familiar with the catchphrase, quote, the American Dream, unquote. To most, it conjures up images of prosperity and freedom. This is, of course, a valid dream or aspiration in any culture. And one cannot deny that America has been and continues to be a great land of opportunity. However, America, like many other countries, has more than its share of problems. Racial tensions are high. The crime rate is escalating. Drug trafficking is big business. Break-ins, muggings, shootings, rape are frequent occurrences, even commonplace in many areas. Abandoned and runaway children are becoming more commonplace. Broken homes, homelessness, and poverty affect thousands. Sexually transmitted diseases are rapidly rising. For many, then, the American dream has meant neither prosperity nor freedom. Why has the, quote, dream, unquote, turned into a nightmare for many? The reasons are many and debatable. From the breakup of the family, to violence in the media, from racism to religious bigotry to the welfare state. Of course, no one has all the answers. But for the sake of simplicity, let us boil all the problems down into one answer, violence. Generally, we all recognize violence when we see it. But where does it originate? We could say that violence has its roots in, quote, meism, unquote. In other words, me against you. Thus, violence becomes both the problem and the cause of the problem. Greed is violence. I feel I deserve more, therefore I take from you. Racism, sexism is violence. I do not appreciate that you are different than me, therefore I abuse you. War is violence. I feel hurt by you, therefore I hurt you. Many people would conclude that there is nothing wrong with seeking opportunities and striving to be one's best. However, it seems that a mature, compassionate individual or group of individuals would consider who or what may be affected harmed, or even destroyed in the pursuit of their goals. Thus, in, quote, meism, unquote, we are talking about a matter of degree. Competition, with a sense of fair play, is what brings about growth, and America is certainly a testament to this fact. However, when any person, group, or nation loses its sense of fair play, and when it becomes the goal regardless, then, quote, meism, unquote, escalates into violence. In the natural cycle of events, this violence is what's happening not only in America, but in many places, obviously, around the world. The questions then seem to be, what do we do about the violence? Where did it come from? How do we evolve beyond it? To answer these questions, the author believes that we must look into America's predominant belief structure. All of our actions and attitudes have their origins in our beliefs. These beliefs are ingrained in all of us from birth. They come from family and friends, the media, educational, cultural, and religious institutions. And whether we admit it or not, religious beliefs play a key role in the predominant belief structure in any culture. America is, of course, a multicultural land with many races, ethnicities, and several of the world's religions. However, Christianity is the predominant religion. Christian beliefs are deeply ingrained in the American psyche. In fact, to many, especially outside of America... America, Christianity, democracy, and prosperity are all synonyms. Even those who would flatly deny that Christian beliefs had any influence over their lives at all, 
might consider the following. Ask an American who professes not to believe in God who this God is that they do not believe in. The answers might be revealing. How many have said or implied that, quote, you only go around once, unquote. The implications are many. Could this attitude stem from the Christian belief in one life to live, as opposed to, example, the Hindu belief in reincarnation? What about a neurotic compulsion to always be right, to be number one? Could this mindset have its origins in an ingrained Christian belief of superiority over all other belief systems? Could an ingrained belief in, quote, absolute truths, unquote, be in part responsible for much of the political gridlock, frozen legislation, and inflexible statutes that do not allow for the obvious extenuating circumstances and other points of view? With an only way program in the minds of many, is it any wonder that many liberals, conservatives, and those in between are sure that the others just don't get it? Any unbiased reader of history will not only be aware of the positive accomplishments of Christianity, but also of the monumental suffering and destruction. America was founded on Christian principles and values that not only brought prosperity and a sense of community to many, but, quote, values, unquote, that also contributed significantly to wiping out Native Americans enslaving blacks, subjugating women. Values that have been responsible in part for instigating violence against those who do not fit the norm. Homosexuals, for example. And of course, all non-Christians. Values that have contributed to harming the planet, exploiting the natural resources, as well as many of the other species that humans share the planet with. Growing up in a WASP environment, the author was shocked when he became aware of the atrocities and injustices committed in the name of Christianity. From Columbus's landfall to a present-day disdain and or suspicion by a great number of Christians of any other individual or religion other than a Christian or Christianity. Ironically, this same suspicion, even disdain, can be found within Christianity itself sect against sect, proving that few of us are ever going to view life in exactly the same way. The author was even further concerned to realize that from his experience, he never heard any of the, quote, spiritual leaders, unquote, ever mention any of this past, and certainly never attempt to apologize for the injustices. It soon became clear that this was either a case of the blind leading the blind or a massive conscious cover-up. Whatever the case, the author soon began to realize that in many ways what was billed as, quote, the greatest story ever told, unquote, was in many ways possibly the greatest hoax ever perpetuated. Many concerned individuals today are seeking for the reasons behind America's recurring violence. The author concludes that Christianity's exclusive doctrine has initiated and perpetuated much of this violence. In particular, the violence of greed, racism, sexism, unnecessary violence against nature and many species of animals, as well as religious bigotry. Basically, this Christian exclusivity has manifested as a disregard for the, quote, other, unquote, be it people, animals, land, ideas, cultures, or religion. Yet, paradoxically, within Christianity's profound virtues also lie some solutions, as many compassionate Christians have exemplified over the centuries. The subsequent chapters will reveal a side of Christianity and consequently much of the American attitude and governmental policy that is fully documented in history, yet seldom spoken of. 
For example, one would have to search long and hard to find any Christian church that included in, quote, the elevating march of Christianity, unquote, the stampede of all the others that stood in the way of the Christian mission. In this work, the author has obviously included his own opinions, but the focus is on the historical facts, with the emphasis given to the voice of the participants, to those who felt fully justified in their actions, and especially to those who have too long been ignored. It should be stated that the intent of this work is not to denigrate all of Christianity or its adherents, and it is certainly not to advocate its demise, nor to incite further violence, nor to denigrate the person Jesus. However, unfortunately, the author recognizes that many will view it in just that way. There will always be those who feel very threatened when their treasured beliefs are questioned, and to such one can only offer compassion. However, there will also be those who have had enough life experience, or just a natural sense of maturity, that will recognize that what is being advocated is a healthy cleansing process that will, perhaps ultimately, even benefit those who are not yet ready to face their own demons. Denial, as any reformed alcoholic knows, is the inability to face up to one's own shortcomings. To constantly cast the blame outside of oneself, as many of us often do, unconsciously sometimes, is to live in that insidious state. Unfortunately, there are many in the religious world, Christian and otherwise, that do just that merely parroting the ideas drummed into them by those equally indoctrinated. Unfortunately, these strong beliefs can often lead to thoughtless emotional acts of violence, meism. Presently, many in the Christian community wonder why they come under attack. They feel, and often rightly so, that their First Amendment rights are being violated. How many of these same Christians take the time to consider what they have done to bring on these attacks? Cause and effect appears to be a natural law difficult to circumvent. Of course, the simple-minded answer for many Christians suffering from denial is to blame it all on the devil and perhaps to declare yet another, quote, holy war, unquote. In the author's opinion, these attacks and criticism against fundamental Christian doctrines are in large part due to the hard sell of the Christian religion and the blind belief that all people everywhere, regardless of cultural and religious background, must embrace Jesus as their personal Savior. This potentially dangerous cultic notion, of course, is no different than a fanatical Muslim, Hindu, Sikh, etc., who naively expects all to follow their particular faith. Obviously, when many people are presented with this kind of fanaticism, they either walk away from the fanatic or are ready to fight. Many in today's world, the spiritual but not religious, throw the baby out with the bathwater, which is also counterproductive. Many Christians would point out that it is not they who are speaking, but rather God's word. Or the Bible. At this point, one might be asked to form a mental picture of God sitting at his desk writing his word. Of course, this is ludicrous, which is exactly the point. Even God's word is misleading in another sense, as it might be more appropriate to say God's words, as religious discourse is seldom limited to one word. Actually, from a mystical and even scientific viewpoint, the reference to the Word that is found in most, if not all, religions is very profound as it is recognized that sound is the first energy emanation of creation, then light. The Bible, like all the scriptures of the world, were written by men, and perhaps women in some cases, However inspired, these profound works contain much that is positive, inspiring, and spiritually uplifting, 
However, because these scriptures were written by humans, there is obviously much room for human error. Errors that have proved to not only be simply false perceptions, but errors that have too often proved to be downright dangerous and destructive. For example, Psalms 93 proclaimed that the world did not move, a, quote, fact, unquote, that proved dangerous for centuries to those who held the opposite view. One can only empathize with Copernicus, and the mental image is striking of poor Galileo on bended knees before the church, recanting what in his heart and mind he knew to be true. This fanatical attitude of holding on to the erroneous, biblically-based geocentric worldview should have been a signal of further misperceptions to come. Ironically, it was pure humanism. Designating the earth as the center of the cosmos and the Bible, written by men, as supremely authoritative, many men thus created God in their own image and passed down a judgment to suit. One can also imagine the shock at being proclaimed a witch. Of course, not before being duly tested, the pinprick and the float test. In other words, there was supposedly one spot on a witch that felt no pain. If a suspect floated when thrown into a body of water, they were declared a witch. Wow. A no-win situation. This madness was given sanction by the Word of God. Exodus 22.18 The religious justification for slavery, which existed, of course, all over the world, was found in Leviticus 25.44. The general attitude of destroying all other religions and prophets was found in numerous passages in Deuteronomy chapters 12 13, 17. Basically, according to these words of God, anyone of another religious persuasion is to be killed. In a strange twist, one has to wonder if this word ultimately applies to the Christian who, of course, does not consider him herself a Jew. However, this same disrespect for all the other carries over into the New Testament as the Apostle Paul gives stern warning, Galatians 1.9, not to even listen to any other gospel. In fact, the teacher of such is to be cursed, according to Paul. And again, in the New Testament, the exclusions continue as the ongoing control of women in general is proclaimed in 1 Corinthians, Corinthians chapter 11, and 1 Timothy chapter 2. As all women are expected to be covered, subjected, and silent. The total disrespect and violence by many Christians towards other species and the environment that has fostered numerous contemporary problems, from species extinction to environmental disasters, was justified by the Word of God. Genesis 1.28 Therefore, recognizing that Christianity is the dominant religious mindset in America, and also that Christian beliefs are deeply ingrained in the American psyche, it would seem wise for us to look not only at the great contributions and positive aspects of Christianity, but also to look at the negative and destructive aspects. Such an honest and fair analysis would in the author's opinion, greatly aid in eliminating much of the misunderstandings, religious bigotry, and other forms of violence in America. This will no doubt be a painful experience for many. However, the author feels that until America in general, and Christianity specifically, wake up to the past, and cease perpetuating violence, meism, many of the same old problems will continue to reoccur. Specifically, the violent problems of greed, racism, sexism, environmental disrespect, 
exploitation of other species, as well as religious and other forms of bigotry, violence that will continue to keep the American dream an illusion rather than a hope for peace, prosperity, and freedom for all. Stay tuned for Chapter 2, Christopher Columbus.